We were just talking a little bit about spirituality in more common conceptions, uh, Christian spirituality without the doctrine of the spirituality of the church specifically in view. Uh, just another way you can speak about it, not simply in terms of something like mysticism or monasticism, but, no, but more commonly uh, the personal disciplines of the faith, prayer, meditation, fasting, oftentimes those things are discussed under spirituality, uh, Christian spirituality, books that would be titled Christian spirituality would typically deal with prayer, meditation, fasting, those sorts of things. Um, and as I have here under 2B, should never be pitted against the public, visible, organized expressions of our faith, but seen as concomitant with it and flowing from it. In other words, uh, many people who have in our culture historically a Jesus, my Bible, and me mentality have a low view of the church, a low view of the institutional church. On the other hand, sometimes uh, we who have a better view of the church go a little, we, 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 we sort of miss the mark. And I remember hearing a, a good friend of mine give a charge to a congregation at the ordination of a pastor. And he said to the congregation, so he's giving them the charge, and he said, it's not your Bible reading and your prayer and your personal communion with God. It's, it's that's at issue. It's the public means of grace. And I'm sitting there going, it's both. <laughs> Excuse me. And he didn't really mean to tell people, don't read the Bible. Don't pray. Because that's a huge mistake. People, in fact, the public only really has as much meaning as the private has been previously engaged. If you go, if you, if you come into church, if you uh, into church, and, you know, you were at last call early this morning, and you've just come into church, and you sit down, and you haven't thought about God since the last time you were sitting in a pew, which could be last week. You're not really that prepared to hear the Word of God. You need to come having prepared yourself. I mean, it's better to come. You know, if you say, it says, may one who doubteth come to the Lord's table, the Westminster Larger Catechism. And the answer is yes. If you have not duly prepared, you may come, but you are to bewail. <laughs> you are to confess and acknowledge, I, I, I'm ill prepared. As you say that to the Lord, Lord, I come here this morning not properly in the sense that I have prepared myself. Forgive me of that. Now, let me get as much out of this as I can and not, you know, you're, 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 you're drifting off while the preacher is preaching because, you know, you're, you're tired and all those kinds of things. You, you, we don't want to pit one against the other. We don't want to over argue public means of grace. I mean, public means of grace are central. They're the central thing. They are the most important thing. And all of our spiritual lives should, in a sense, take place in the light of them. But it's certainly, if you're getting something out of the preaching, if you're, you, you, it's not like, well, you know, I don't want to be a religious fanatic, so I'm not going to look at the Bible again until next week. No, you, you want to look at it the next morning or that evening or ever how you, I mean, after ever how you do it. I mean, we look at it in the afternoon of that day in our family. Um, why not, right? Uh, I, I don't think most of us are in danger of a spiritual gluttony of too much of the Word. I think more likely we're in danger of spiritual anorexia, if I may say. I don't think our, our, our danger is, wow, we're just too much. We're, you know, we're so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly good. I mean, the people that are most properly heavenly minded are of the most earthly good, actually. <laughs> um, so, spirituality of the church, as I say here, good and bad, uh, and I, I list there a couple of articles. Um, so, let's assume you haven't gotten the book and you're not going to get the book, and you needn't get the book, just get the, the next one coming out, because it's for the person in the pew. I mean, that's the point. And so, yes, I, I will 
have to be very disciplined to write this book. Uh, I don't necessarily most natively write for the person in the pew. I have to mm, really buckle down and think about it. That's what sermons are, but this isn't a, a book of sermons. Um, there's a couple of articles there uh, that are uh, Mid America Journal articles, so you can go and look at the Mid America Journal in 2014 and 2016, and some of this stuff is talked about. Um, Machen, uh, and there's a great Warfield quote, we'll maybe do that later, but Machen in his time um, had a great quote, uh, I think, respecting the. Um, the question of the spirituality of the church uh, that occurs uh, near the end of his great work, Christianity and Liberalism. Christianity and Liberalism, I assume you know who J. Gressa Machen is, a very important uh, 20th century figure. In terms of the OPC, he's one of the, he would hate, he, he didn't like it. I mean, he died January 1st, 1937. So he was, then the church was formed June 11, 1936. But he didn't want to, he would have, if you would have said this church, you were the founder of the church, he would say Jesus Christ was the founder of the church. Now, you know, I mean, and, but he didn't want to, he was a humble man. But the book, Christianity and Liberalism, uh, next year, well, in two years, 23, will be the 100th anniversary. And if you've never read that book, you should, it's beautifully written. It reads like it was written yesterday, in my estimation. It's just so gorgeously written. And, um, Machen is defending here a kind of spirituality of the church over against uh, a, an approach that would that would just bring the world and all of its concerns and land them right in the midst of the church. And you know we would be debating what the tax rate should be, and we're going to differ among ourselves because the Bible doesn't say this. We would be you know what should the precise nature of gun rights be or not be? Now, and I've had I, when I've said some of these things in some places, they're like, you don't think the Bible tells you all that? Well, no, frankly it doesn't. And let's stop playing like it does. The Bible tells us what we're to believe chiefly about our Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of Christ, and how we ought to live for Him, how we should then live. Every political kind of thing that we may address, which we legitimately address, and you legitimately as a Christian, and Christians can have different views of it. I once had somebody arguing with me, he took a principle as he understood it, and said, clearly I was, he said, don't you think we should have term limits? Uh, for all offices, for, for, for representatives and Senate. And I said, no, I don't. And he said, well, and he started quoting the Bible. I said, oh, I, I didn't think you were saying this to me as a Christian. As a Christian, I don't have a position on that in the sense that the Bible has a position on it. I mean, I don't have a, there, there isn't a clear Bible position on that. Uh, and he's talking about, well, our founding fathers, you know, limit of power and power corrupts. And I said, well, I agree with that. I think these are biblical principles. I said, but you're talking about them. They understood and they limited. They didn't put term limits in the Constitution. They didn't put term limits for either senators or representatives. So, and he was like, I think he stormed away at that point. I don't know. But the point is, the Bible doesn't solve that for us. It doesn't tell us. Well, we have to argue that. And my point, I, I was prepared to have an argument with him, but he wanted to, he wanted to, to, you know, pull out the scripture and say, this settles it. Well, no, it doesn't. That doesn't settle the question of term limits. It just doesn't. It's not honest, frankly. It's not honest. The Bible isn't meant to give us that level of detail. It's not telling us in a detailed way how to live. And we were talking about, you know, Israel and theonomy. Even if you look at the Old Testament, and I've had people say, well, the Old Testament gave them pretty exhaustive detail for how to live their lives. No, it didn't even do that. I mean, there was stuff left up to wisdom. For example, one of the chief concerns of all peoples in the ancient Near East were water rights. The Old Testament says nothing about water rights. It doesn't get into the subject. So then people try to make the Bible be what they want it to be. I say, let's let the Bible be what the Bible is. Let's let the Bible, let's let the Bible set the plate and me not set the plate and say, this is what the Bible has to do. It has to give us a detailed blueprint for society. And I would argue that it's actually never done that. It's never given a deep, a detailed blueprint for all matters in society. It's got principles that cover everything. It always has done that. 
And it's got, it forms our faith understanding and we approach things through faith understanding and we should. But doing that doesn't mean we're going to get all the answers. It's going to solve, you know, and the problem with that is, is then what are we going to add to our confessions term? We believe as a, as a, as a matter of faith that term limits I should put that in the confession, that we should amend the confession. So this is our problem. We need to be able to be in our churches and agree on what the Bible teaches in terms of its great doctrines. And people can have some differences. And then shame on us if my greatest kinship is not with people in my own church who believe what it teaches, but people who are outside, maybe not even Christians, who agree politically with me. Well, I'm, I'm stepping on some toes here because they need to be stepped on. You need to agree on the basis of doctrine. I don't, you know, I've had people, well, and I even had somebody say this to me seriously. What would you, are you more, would you be more concerned about a Christian who had some, some liberal views on things? And I said, define what you mean by that. Are you talking they're pro-abortion? No, no, no. Are you talking they believe in same sex? No, no, no. Okay, because those are clear biblical matters. <laughs> there are matters that are clearly biblical. There are other things that are not, like the term limits. Or what should the tax rate be? Oh, I've had, I get letters from people, what the tax rate should be. This is what the Bible says. And I appreciate what you're saying. You can, you can try to make the arguments. But it's, you should notice we've never put this in our confessions. There's a reason we've never put this in our confessions. Because it's, it's not something we're saying we have to agree on this. Uh, so, this is what Machen said. Weary with the conflicts of the world, one goes into the church to find refreshment for the soul. And what does one find? Alas, too often one finds only the turmoil of the world. The preacher comes forward, not out of a secret place of meditation and power, not with the authority of God's Word permeating his message, not with human wisdom pushed far into the background by the glory of the cross, but with human opinions about the social problems of the hour are easy solutions of the vast problem of sin. Such is the sermon. And then he says, is there no refuge from strife? Is there no place of refreshing where a man can prepare for the battle of life? Is there no place where two or three can gather in Jesus' name, to forget for the moment all those things that divide nation from nation and race from race, to forget human pride, to forget the passions of war, to forget the puzzling problems of industrial strife, and to unite in overflowing gratitude at the foot of the cross. If there be such a place, then that is the house of God, and that the gate of heaven. And from under the threshold of that house will go forth a river that will revive the weary world." And I say Machen's plea is for a church that knows its spiritual calling and properly understands that it is not the world and that it does the world the least good by seeking to be most like it. That's actually a, a little, it's a version of a, of a quote of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And Lloyd-Jones says, the church does the world the least good when it seeks to be most like it. Because we're not to be simply an echo of the world. And if you look at liberalism as it developed, uh, what was classic liberalism or something that may become progressivism or something to the far left, if you look at that, what it has been for a century and a half easily is just some version of, a, of Me Tooism. In other words, the world says this, the progressives or the left say this, and the church it says, me too. We're for all these things too. We're for the LGBTQT plus agenda. Yes, we're right there. We're right there. And they're abandoning their spiritual mission. They're abandoning the Bible. They're abandoning the truth. We have the truth, not arguments about, you know, term limits, but the true truth to use Fran Schaefer's term, right? You remember that? Dr. Schaefer used to say, true truth. We have true truth. Uh, not just some passing fancies of the hour. And you see what Machen is calling for here. Uh, and he's saying, this is what the world needs. Uh, from under the threshold of that house will go forth a river. You know, you could stop and sing uh, like a river glorious, right? <laughs> go forth a river that will revive the weary world. Isn't that what the world... The world does not need us to be some version of it on the political far right or the political far left or anything distinct 
strictly political in that sense. Again, that's not to say we don't take moral positions that the Bible takes. We don't take positions, legal positions that the Bible takes that impact politics, but we're not taking them for the sake of politics. We're not taking them to be political. To and. We've seen this, especially in the last decade, in a lot of ways. And just to, to, to criticize what would be perceived probably as more things on our side in American Christianity, um, you, can, you can see this with some of the, uh, at least generally people in our places have been more reserved, Reformed and Presbyterian types who are confessional have been more reserved with embracing whole any politician, whether it's of the left or the right. Whereas you've got, you've got liberal churches that embrace whole, you know, progressive politicians. And you, I mean, there were a lot of our charismatic and Pentecostal brethren that embraced whole everything Donald Trump did. And they spoke of it. They said he's anointed. What bizarre nonsense. Really? Why would you talk about a political leader that way? You say, you say you like the guy. You know, I mean, think of somebody who was conservative somewhat but didn't have all of the obvious flaws of Trump. Think of somebody like Ronald Reagan who, who was, you know, conservative but was could speak well, never would speak you know, hatefully to people. Just take him as an example. Would you say he's anointed? Do you think he would want you to say he's anointed? I mean, that's just goofy, folks. But that's what's going on right now in our culture. And that's why, that's why Crossway wants me to write this book. I mean, I've been very surprised. I mean, it isn't a very common thing that a publisher like that reads some arcane dissertation and says, would you write a book on it? I mean, I, this has just been a huge shock to me, but it's sort of hitting me. They're really concerned about this, partly to be blunt now. They're concerned about it on our side of things. They're concerned about some of our churches, um, the PCA in some respects, I'll, I'll just say that. They're concerned about that in terms of things like CRT or BLM, that the church is just sort of uh, you know, this progressive movement is just kind of inundating certain churches and it's politicizing. Other churches have politicized, like, like I say, you know, some of our churches, you know, maybe uh, I, I have heard one of our ministers, he's somebody in my own denomination, say some things, make some comparisons about Trump and, and Biden and say back when they were running and basically give Trump the biblical mantle, which I was just breathless. He even was quoting Micah, you know, walk humbly with our God, which one does better? And I don't think I've ever heard Donald Trump in walk humbly with God in the same sentence. I mean, it's like, are you, is this a joke? It's a bad one. He's, no, humble. I mean, it's, it's prostituting our religion for the, the spirituality of the church is saying, don't prostitute the Christian faith for your political ends. That's part of what's being said here. Don't, you know, you got a party over here, you got a party over here, and we will not put the Christian faith in their service. We're not going to do it. It's wrong. And we lose our focus. We lose our mission. We lose what we have to say to the world. Because we've just become another, another, uh, as I say here in my, uh, in my, um, my proposal that, that Crossway adopted, uh, we become, uh, let's see, how did I put it? Um, let me read you this. The church is at its core a spiritual institution that ought to pay attention to the nature and limits of church power. The nature of church power is ministerial and declarative, and its limits are that which the Word of God addresses. Such a focus will keep the institutional church on task carrying out the Great Commission and not prompt her to think that her calling is chiefly social, economic, or political. Indeed, as the church teaches the nations to observe all that God commands, consequences emerge that may be deemed political, for example, opposition to abortion, racism, same-sex marriage, and so forth. The church must not, however, engage in politics as such, especially that which would divide persons of goodwill who have similar biblical and theological commitments. The highly charged partisan political currents can impact the church 
as well as civil society, we certainly see that in civil society, especially when it comes to the temptation of those on both extremes, left and right, to bring their social, economic, political, and like agendas into the church. The church as church may have something to say about present concerns, which is to say that God's Word may address such, usually in principle though, not in detail, in any case, not in a way that renders the church just another voice in the current cacophony of shouted political slogans, but in a way that contributes a proper faith perspective to vexing moral questions in the public square. This has to be carefully done. The widespread politicization of our times can also lure the church to politicize, and if the church politicizes, becoming just one more partisan caucus promoting its agenda, the gospel may well be lost. The church is the only agency that our Lord has commissioned to bring the gospel to the world. Think about that. The state's not commissioned to do that. Now we've got, you know, we got weirdos now, patriarchal types who say, well, the family is. No, it isn't. The family as the family is not. The family is to be a part of the church. But it's not called as a family to do what the church is called to do. There is a distinction between, I mean, Jesus didn't call 12 brothers. I mean, some of them were brothers. But the church is composed of many families, including single people which our churches don't do very well with, but that's another matter. Um, if the church allows its, the gospel to become secondary to a political agenda, there's no body that can bring the good news of the risen Christ to a needy world. We need to be salt and light. We need to witness to the power of Christ and His gospel in an unsavory dark world in a way that does not avoid the great moral issues of our time, bringing a clear prophetic witness to them, but also in a way that does not swamp the boat so that the gospel gets sunk in a sea of cultural concerns. And there's a lot more to say there. But that's, hopefully you can see that's what I'm trying to get across here. Um, and I think Machen gets that across beautifully in that world. The bad, and I can, you know, the, the bad aspects of spirituality of the church, and I think that there are those who use spirituality of the church even today in a bad way. It, it, it comes out as indifference to others, including the world. I'm not saying we're the church in our holy huddle. We're in our holy huddle, and boy, the world is so bad, we're going to stay over here and nobody actually says this, but in effect just let them go to hell. They're going to hell, let them go to hell. We must not say that. We must get the gospel to the world because that's God's intention. That's His intention, to give the gospel to the world. And not for us to be in a frightened holy huddle, to be indifferent to the world, and to cultivate what I call a fortress mentality or worldliness. There is also a type of the spirituality of the church, just like there's a type of a two kingdom approach, where one spirituality is all expressed on Sunday. It's a Sunday Christianity. Well, we've all heard, and we don't believe in simply a Sunday Christianity. We, that, a Sunday Christianity should be central. It's important. But you're nothing if you're not a Christian then on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You're a Christian all the time. And while there is a proper separation, as I was talking to my good brother Gabe there, there's a proper separation between church and state, um, that doesn't mean there's a separation between God and state. That's not what we're talking about. That's what a lot of people mean when they say separation between church and state. They mean keep your church, keep all of your Christian beliefs, keep them over there in a corner. And we're not even sure if they should be legal. I mean, that's we're moving in that way. We're not sure if we should tolerate this. Um, and so the, it's not a matter of... of of, of a separation of church and state. We all agree on a proper distinction from church and state. We don't want the state to be over the church. I don't think anybody wants that here. Or the church to be over the state. We don't want that. We want them both properly under God. And we also cannot separate, you know, if you're out as a Christian on your job, as, a, as Venema put it, a butcher, baker, candlestick maker, each in their position are to be living as a Christian. Um, we can't separate whatever your view of kingdoms or anything is. While I say we separate church and state, we understand a division, there's a distinction between them. We never separate, uh, we never separate uh, faith from what we're doing. 
we're always a people of faith, and that goes everywhere we go. So, yes, there are bad parts of this, and it, th so this is something that can be abused, like so many things can be abused. But abusus non tolet usum, right? I know you're thinking that. The abuse of something does not mean there's not a proper use of it. I mean, if we don't understand that, we're really sunk. I mean, that's a big problem today because. There's a lot of talk about abuse, and I think abuse is something that is a real problem in culture, in the church even, and it's often been shoved under the rug, that's true, but what's being said is because there are fathers who abuse, uh, there are husbands who abuse their authority, fathers who abuse their authority, uh, there are employees who abuse their authority, there are rulers who abuse their authority, they have no legitimate authority. Well, it's not true. That doesn't dissolve the legitimate authority of something. And so we have to be able to talk about that. There are people that think, and there are people really who have suffered some kind of abuse in church situations where they've been told things that maybe they've been told, you know, you can't drink or chew or go with girls who do or whatever. I mean, which aren't biblical things, but, they, but they've had that enforced on them. And their takeaway is there is no legitimate church authority. Well, see, that isn't the correct takeaway. The correct takeaway is that's an abuse of church authority. But that doesn't mean there's not proper church authority, and it's to be properly used and properly submitted to, because it's been abused. Abuse, that is a huge issue in society right now. This notion that abuse takes away all valid authority. Uh, and it's, it's revolutionary. It's revolutionary because you know, it, it, it is the Marxist agenda to overthrow all legitimate authority. That's, that's been the agenda ever since Karl and before Karl. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, it comes particularly in the French Revolution, which we, we could spend a fruitful hour talking about the difference between the French Revolution and the American War for Independence. They're very different. They're very different creatures. The French Revolution is a very different thing. The American War for Independence was about the question of home, was about the question of home rule. In other words, colonies wanting to have the independence from the mother country and to be respected and treated with respect, as opposed to the question of who shall rule at home. And you say, well, how do you know? Well, who were the leaders before the American War for Independence? They were Washington, they were Adams, they were Jefferson, they were Madison. Who were the leaders after that? One of the John Fay's book. I, so this is you say. Is this relevant to the course? Everything is relevant to this course. Yes. Um, next question. Now, um, but John John Fay. You know who were the leaders before those guys? Who were the leaders after those same guys? Oh, is, is that not true with the French Revolution? <laughs> Those people were all killed. It was an internal revolt in which the, the monarchy and the nobility were axed, basically. The upper classes uh, were axed. And uh, that's not what happened here. It's a different sort of a thing. Um, and I'm, I, am I saying one's good and one's bad? Well, I do think one is better and one is worse. Well, I, I do think the French Revolution is a huge mess. And I mean, it starts, everything Karl Marx talks about, he looks back to that. I mean, it starts, this is why the Dutch brethren call their party the Inter-Revolutionary Party. They're talking about the French Revolution. They rightly understood the French Revolution was the modern beginning of many troubles. <laughs> many troubles. Um, and they didn't, they didn't have the same view. I mean, you can read, and I have a nice there, thing there uh, on, for you on Kuiper, is on that first page there. Um, Kuiper, uh, in the reading in Volume 4 on the church, this is in the, the beautiful Collected Works set that has been published by Lexham Press, beautiful set. This is in Volume 4 of the set. Um, there are 11 out currently. And his work on the church in, uh, it's about 100 pages there. Now, now there's a whole new volume that's on the church and state, which I just got about, I don't know, some weeks ago. And I, I, I'm looking forward to reading the whole thing. I have not read, read it, but I'm looking forward to, I'm going to have a Kuiper feast. I have a sabbatical coming up, so uh, God willing, I will be reading many things, including a lot of Kuiper, which I'm looking forward to. 
he loved the whole American thing. Kuiper did. He he thought it was great. So it's you know when when people will just say I had somebody say well Kuiper wouldn't like America anti revolutionary party and I'm like you haven't read any Kuiper have you you just you're just making that up huh, aren't you because we happen to have something that's called a revolution. I mean it really wasn't a revolution uh, in in, a, in any proper way. It was I mean you know and what you had in France was what you had in Russia was so forth. So. The biblical view of church and state. Um, I want to say this about Philemon, why I read Philemon to you. I've got a lot to say about Philemon, but um, and I'll say it in the book. Um, I think Philemon is a very key uh, passage and focus for the doctrine of the spirituality of the church because it the doctrine of the spirituality of the church is you say is it directly taught well i think there are passages of scripture certainly john 18:36 when jesus says my kingdom is not of this world that's a very key passage uh, i've got i've just written a new sermon on that because i was i was privileged to be doing the men's conference at St. Andrews and I was preaching in the great pulpit at St. Andrews down in Florida and so I, uh, I said okay I'm writing a new sermon for this and it was interesting the reaction I got there one fellow came up to me it was a little odd but you know who am I to say something like that um, but he said you know he said I'm he said he said, "This is most surprising. Uh, one of the one of the liveliest persons I've ever seen in this pulpit, and he's a minister in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Unexpected, unexpected. He just, I was just kind of like, okay. <laughs> he's like unexpected, you know, because I did. I, I I was in. I was in. I, I realized at several points because you're in a high pulpit, and and I'm leaning over. And of course, the you know one of the great pictures of Knox is his leaning over the pulpit." and pointing out at the congregation. So it actually did enter my head for a minute. I was being, so I leaned over a few more times and <laughs> pointed. But I got this guy going and, and, and I said, and I said, a professor to boot. And he's like, yes, yes, a professor. Because that also people, you know, they figure if you're a professor, you're going to put everybody to sleep in the first two or three sentences. Um, but Philemon is really interesting because Paul um, was key in the conversion of Philemon and in his coming to Christ Paul was Philemon's spiritual father. And Onesimus was a slave in Philemon's household who was a fugitive, right? He fled and he ends up with coming into Paul's sphere and orbit and Paul gives him the gospel and becomes a Christian. And so Onesimus, which, uh, you know, he's, he was useless. His name means useful. Well, now he will be useful, Paul says. And Paul found him personally very useful to him in the ministry. But he recognizes that he's come from uh, Philemon's household, so he urges him, he sends him back to the household. And he does not tell Philemon, you must manumit him. You must grant him his freedom. But it's very clear that he clearly suggests that. Now it is interesting, some commentators say, for example, well verse 16, isn't he just saying no longer as a slave but more than a slave as a beloved brother, treat him really well as a Christian. Well, Paul has already said in Colossians and Ephesians that all masters should treat all their slaves really well. So I, I think he's saying something more than that. Uh, and I think he's suggesting to him that he should free him. But I, here's what I want you to see. He doesn't command it because he understands it to be, I think, a consequence of the gospel. The gospel is preached. What is the gospel? The gospel is the person and work of Christ, who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. And the call that goes out when the gospel is preached to everyone who hears it is to repent and believe. So the gospel is preached, who Jesus is and what He's done for you. He's done for you what you can never do for yourself. And then the minister says, I hope, I hope He didn't just tell you that and don't say repent and believe because He hasn't done His job. He needs to preach that and then He needs to say repent and believe. That is, put all your faith and trust in Him and turn from your e evil ways. Turn from those ways to Him. And then there are many consequences that follow because faith works through love. 
And, but we want to be careful to distinguish, which is something that our Federal Vision friends didn't do. They didn't properly distinguish faith from its working. And when it comes to justification, the working of faith is not in view at all. Because Christ's work is what's in view. And it's your trusting that work. But when you do trust that work, then you obey. Then you obey Him. But the obedience has no part, plays no part in your justification. And you say, well, and I've had people say to me, that's all such a, I said, if you want to say these are fine points, that's the Reformation. That's the Reformation. I mean, don't tell me they're fine points. I don't disagree that they're fine points. This is why, doc, I shouldn't tell you this. You shouldn't, don't listen to this. You can't hear this. But no, because you hadn't had the class yet. But Dr. Beach loves to do a thing. and Dr. Beach, He'll read, he'll do this. He likes to draw the students in and then smack them a bit. <laughs> he'll read, he'll read the, the Arminian's points. He won't tell you what he's reading. And he'll put them, he'll just jump in here or there. He's like, that's, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I mean, that's, that's not. Because a lot of people don't even know. They think that the Arminians are like glaringly wrong. No, no, they're wrong. But it's much more subtle than that. And he'll say, you're, congratulations, you're an Arminian. And then he goes on to say, these doctrinal points are not always these, I mean, it's not like, you know, people who have, who have errors are walking around, like, you know, from Doctor Who, warning, warning, or whatever, you know, saying, you know, I'm in error, be, be, beware here. No, uh, they're, they're often rather subtle. And... Um, what happened in the Reformation is, I mean, if you read Trent, I'll read Trent to guys and say, what's wrong with this? But I'll say, this is the difference between heaven and hell, what they're saying here, how they're defining justification. Because it ultimately has to do with you. But justification doesn't ultimately have to do with you. It has to do with Him. Because if it ultimately has to do with you, you're lost. And I'm lost. Everybody's lost. Everybody's lost. But it's Him. But working in us, He does give us that ability. But here's, here's my point. Paul knew well that if he as an apostle made it a command to Philemon to manumit this fellow, not something he suggests, and not something he says, uh, how much more you owe to me. And he says in verse 21, I'm confident of your obedience. You'll do what I ask. You will do even more than I say. So, I mean, can anybody imagine that Philemon gets this letter, and he's all hard-hearted, and he's like, no way. Where, where's Onesimus? Give me a whip. You know, wham. I mean, really. I mean, no. You, you do not imagine that he's going to go after the guy who left. Paul knows how he is. He knows what he's going to do. But you say, what's your point here? If Paul had made it a command, that would have meant there's an apostolic command to abolish slavery. And everybody must do it, and everybody must be involved in it. It's not a consequence of the gospel. It would subvert it. It would become the gospel itself. It would subvert the gospel. The gospel wouldn't be heard. At this point, about 40% of the Roman Empire is slave or slaves. About 40%. And you see, the message comes into every kind of culture, and it doesn't right in the first place go after everything in the culture. It doesn't go after the, as Calvin puts it, I mean, it's interesting that this fellow was telling me about term limits. The Bible tells about term limits. And I said to him, the Bible doesn't even specify a particular form of government. And he's like, who said that kind of an agnostic thing? I said, John Calvin. John Calvin says the Bible does not say you shall have a monarchy or you shall have a republic or you shall have a democracy. It doesn't say that. It doesn't give us that. I mean, John Calvin said a lot of things like that because he knew what he was talking about. <laughs> it doesn't tell us that. And so, Paul did not say to Philemon, free this man, I command you to do it. Because that would have been, everybody would have said, this, these Christians are trying to overthrow them. And everybody would have been saying, you know, the entire Roman Empire, I am Spartacus, I am Spartacus, I am Spartacus. And that's, there would have been revolution. And there wouldn't have been this going forth of the gospel as it did go forth. Now, you can read somebody like Carl ha Kyle Harper, Peter Brown talks about this. It's, it's in the bibliography. It is the case that over some many decades and even centuries, 
slavery is going to wane altogether and just cease. It's going to cease because of this influence of Christianity. Now, we're, when we can talk about the kind of slavery that that was. It was bad. and In many ways it was not nearly ever as bad as American slavery was. And one of the great tragedies of the church, really one of the great tragedies of the church, is the, the role that the church played in the waning of ancient slavery and then sadly it played in some respects a part in modern slavery coming back in the 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, it would have been much better if the church had said, no, this is man stealing, this is not what should be done. You say, well, nobody saw that. Certainly no Presbyterians. Oh, no, the Covenanters, the Covenanters, um, the RPCNA, that's the church today, they all along said slavery is unbiblical. They were consistent in it. That you can't be a member of the church if you own slaves. And these were hardly pushover. The, oh, well, they're liberal Presbyterians. I would like, so I will give you $10 if you go tell a Covenanter that they're a liberal Presbyterian. Because they're going to sock you in the eye. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> no. So that's where we end with Philemon here. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the Gospel, for the good news, and the consequences of it. That it's not revolutionary in the sense that revolutionary means the overthrow of an established order for its own sake, to overthrow oppressive social and political structures for their own sake. But we know, Father, that when we trust in Christ, we are transformed. And transformation is the dynamic of this in society. Not revolution, but the Holy Spirit working in hearts, the Holy Spirit changing lives, the Holy Spirit transforming us. And so, Lord, do that in and among us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.